Hi, I'm Dr. Heather Holloman, Professor of Political Science at Brunel University. Brunel stresses the importance of civic engagement with our faculty, staff, and students. In light of the upcoming presidential election, I've been asked to provide a brief overview of the election process. First, I want to acknowledge that tensions are high. Many people are worried about their physical and economic security after the election. Many of us are experiencing high levels of stress and or anxiety about the upcoming election, its outcome, and what comes after. Sometimes we're better able to handle stress and anxiety by having more information about the things which are stressing us out. This presentation is an effort to provide you some historical context and legal information about the election process by answering some frequently asked questions. A lot of people are asking why this campaign is so divisive. The political rhetoric has at times been rather heated on all sides. Many have felt a high level of animosity between the candidates and between the supporters of the different candidates. Unfortunately, this is not new to the American political process. We have often lost sight of the value of civic discourse when discussing different candidates and their policies. From the very beginning of our country, we have seen divisive campaigns which relied heavily on personal insults. For example, the 1800 presidential candidates, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, shown here on this slide, both argued that the future of America hung in the balance. While they didn't have TV commercials to spread their messages, they did print and distribute pamphlets criticizing one another. The Jefferson campaign wrote that Adams, quote, possessed that strange compound of ignorance and ferocity, of deceit and weakness, end quote. Many of the personal attacks had little to do with policy. The Jefferson campaign said that Adams was, Quote, a hideous hermaphroditical character, which has neither the force and firmness of a man nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. End quote. In response, the Adams campaign wrote that Jefferson was quote, nothing but a mean spirited, low lived fellow, the son of a half breed Indian squaw sired by a Virginia mulatto father, end quote, and claimed that he enjoyed the taste of fricasseed bullfrog. I don't know exactly why that's an insult, but historians assure me that it was. Another highly divisive campaign was in 1828, when Andrew Jackson ran against John Quincy Adams. This campaign has actually been called the dirtiest campaign in U.S. history. Jackson was accused of multiple murders and acts of violence during the campaign. Jackson's supporters responded by claiming that John Quincy Adams spent his tenure as the first U.S. minister to Russia procuring American virgins for the czar. Even Jackson's mother and wife were considered to be fair game by the newspapers of the day, and extremely rude comments were made about their morality and sexual activities. As you can see, tensions and emotions run high during presidential elections. We need to be cognizant of that and give one another space. Practice self-care. Reach out to trusted friends, families, professors to talk through your concerns. At the end of this presentation is a slide listing members and email addresses of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusive Excellence Workgroup who are happy to provide a safe space in which you can share your hopes and or concerns about the election. Perhaps the leading question is who's going to win? The answer simply is whomever receives 270, the majority, of electoral college votes, or in the case of a contingent election, the person chosen by the House of Representatives. I'll explain contingent elections in a minute. So here's how the Electoral College works. The Constitution lets each state determine how to pick the electors of that state. Each state has the number of electors equal to the number of senators, two, plus the number of representatives, which is determined by population. The District of Columbia gets three electors. The map on this slide shows you how many electors every state has for the 2020 election. In Georgia, there is a set of electors pledged to support the Democratic nominee, Joe Biden, the Libertarian nominee, Joe Jorgensen, and the Republican nominee, Donald Trump. Other states have electors dedicated to Green Party nominee, Howie Hawkins, and others. When you cast your vote for president, you are technically not voting for Biden, Trump, or Jorgensen, but for the list of electors chosen by their party to support them. For every state except two, whomever wins the plurality in the state gets the totality of electors. Whichever candidate then receives the most votes in Georgia would receive our 16 electoral votes.
Well, then what happens if there isn't a clear winner in the Electoral College? What happens if there's a tie? Or because there are more than two candidates running, no candidate receives a majority? This is called a contingent election. Contingent elections are decided by the newly elected Congress. The Congress, which will have just been voted in in November, convenes on January 23rd. The newly elected House of Representatives chooses the president from the top three candidates in the Electoral College vote. There is a state-by-state -state vote, and every state gets only one vote. So no matter how many representatives the state has, they only get one electoral contingent vote. D.C. does not get a vote. Every state determines how they are going to vote. In order to win, a candidate must receive the votes of 26 states. If no one receives 26 states, they vote again. Then they vote again, and they vote again, and they continue voting until the House chooses someone with 26 states. If no president were chosen by January 20th, the vice president acts as the president until the new president is chosen. The newly elected Senate chooses the vice president from the top two candidates in the Electoral College vote. Each senator votes individually, so one senator from a state could vote for the Republican vice presidential candidate, and the other senator from that same state could vote for the Democratic vice presidential candidate. Again, the District of Columbia does not receive a vote. In order to win, a candidate needs the vote of 51 senators. If no vice president is chosen by January 20th, the Speaker of the House acts as president, and the President pro tem of the Senate acts as the vice president. The president pro tem is the highest ranking senator of the majority party. Has this ever happened? Has the House ever decided who will be president? Yes, but not often. In 1800, the divisive campaign I spoke about a few minutes ago between Thomas Jefferson and John Adams led to a contingent election. In 1800, the House voted to give the election to Jefferson. The difficulty in determining who would be president led to the passage of the 12th Amendment, which clarified the electoral process and called for separate presidential and vice presidential elections. The second time the House of Representatives determined who would be president was in 1824. In this election, there were four presidential candidates, pictured on this slide. The four candidates led to a fractioning of the Electoral College vote. General Andrew Jackson won a plurality, that means the most, of the electoral vote, but not a majority. During the House debate, an agreement, known as the Corrupt Bargain, was reached between Speaker of the House, Henry Clay, and John Quincy Adams. In exchange for Clay's support, Clay, by the way, had come in fourth place, so was no longer being considered a candidate. John Quincy Adams promised Clay the position of Secretary of State in the new Adams administration. Clay's support of Adams was sufficient to give the presidential election to Adams. Can you win the election but lose the popular vote? Absolutely, and it has happened several times. You see a list of the five cases here on this slide. The Electoral College vote, except for those two states, Nebraska and Maine, is determined by winner take all. So if you as a candidate win one more vote in a state, you get all of those states' electors. Here in the slide, the winner of the election is in bold, and you can see how many they actually lost the popular vote by. So in 1876, Hayes won the Electoral College vote, but actually had 264,000 fewer popular votes than Tilden. What happens if there's a challenge to the results? It will probably happen this year, as it does almost every election. There are challenges either by voters or by the candidates. The most recent and significant challenge occurred as a result of the Bush versus Gore election in 2000. To make a long story short, there were some difficulties in Florida. At the time, Florida was using paper ballots, which voters marked with a voting pin. Sometimes a voter wouldn't push the pin completely through the paper, so the election commission had to determine the intended vote. On the left is an image which shows some of the variations that were possible. A big problem was that different counties made the determination of an intended vote differently. Did the paper have to be pushed all the way through 
so as to make a swinging door or a hanging door chair? What if the person had barely uh, made a mark on the paper so that you had a dimple chad? Or even less than that, you had only a pregnant chad, which was sort of a bulge in the paper, but no clear mark that the pin had been um, pushed for that candidate. Well, the different counties made those decisions differently. The election was a very close one, and whomever won Florida's electoral votes would win the election. There were several challenges to the ballot count in different counties by both candidates. The most significant was Miami-Dade County. As recounts and re-recounts occurred, the election results changed. Eventually, the Supreme Court said that while different standards of voting in different counties was a problem, there wasn't enough time to fix that by the deadline. The county should quit recounting, and the previous vote certification for Bush stood. This gave Bush Florida's 25 electoral votes for a total of 271 electoral votes and the election. Vice President Gore had 266 electoral votes. There were several protests and demonstrations during the process, and the Supreme Court's decision is still highly contested today. Nevertheless, Al Gore conceded the election, and President Bush was inaugurated in 2001. Can Congress itself challenge electoral votes? Yes, since the law that was passed in 1887. During the official reporting of electoral votes in a joint session, which is when both chambers meet together, members of Congress may object to individual electoral votes or to state returns as a whole. These objections must be declared in writing and signed by at least one representative and one senator. If an objection is received, the joint session recesses and each chamber considers the objection separately in a session which cannot last more than two hours with each member speaking from no more than five minutes. After each House votes on whether or not to accept the objection, the joint session reconvenes and both chambers disclose their decisions. If they agree to the objection, the votes in question are not counted. If either chamber does not agree with the objection, the votes are counted. Objections to the Electoral College votes were recorded in 1969 and 2005. In both cases, the House and Senate rejected the objections and the votes in question were counted. The image on this slide is from 2016 when Joe Biden, who as vice president was the president of the Senate, had to overturn multiple objections to electoral votes as they were not written and signed by both a House member and a senator. There's a lot of talk about the polls in the media. Well, what if the polls are wrong? Most were in the 2016 Trump versus Clinton race, and most famously in 1948, Dewey versus Truman. This iconic photograph shows a very happy Truman holding up a copy of the Daily Press, which erroneously reported that Dewey had won the election. How can the polls be wrong? Well, while polls are a very sophisticated estimation of people's behavior, they are only that. They can only predict using analysis of past and current patterns of behavior. Only people can truly decide how they will behave. Individual votes do matter. Your vote matters. There are links to two respected nonpartisan holistic election polling sites at the end of this presentation. But when will we know who won? There isn't a definitive answer for that, but on January 20th, there will be a president. The contingent elections might take longer than January 20th, but there are processes in place so that there will be a sitting president and a sitting vice president. This graph gives you the 2021 electoral uh, timeline that shows you from election day on November 3rd through January 20th when the new president is inaugurated. This slide shows you the percentages of people who think we will know who won the election at different points in time. 23% of registered voters, purple here, 28% of Trump supporters in the red, and 19% of Biden supporters, shown in blue, think we will find out on November 3rd who won the election. In my professional opinion, this is highly unlikely. Why? Usually we do know on election night who won. 
But remember, in 2000, it took 36 days and a Supreme Court decision to determine that President Bush had won the election. This election is unlike any others we've had before because of the manner in which people are voting. About 40% say they plan to vote in person on November 3rd, which means that 60% are either voting early or via absentee ballots. No matter how many people are voting, it takes a while to count those votes. Even when votes are electronically submitted, the accuracy of the votes must be confirmed. In 2016, about 138 million people voted. This year, there has been an unprecedented number of people voting early, either in person or via mail. At least 40 million people had already voted by October 20. There has also been an unprecedented number of absentee and mail-in ballots. Every state determines its own processes, including the deadline to apply for an absentee or mail-in ballot, when the ballot must be received in order to be counted. Some states accept them after the election as long as they're postmarked by election day. When the ballots can be counted, in some states they're counted as they're collected. In some states they can't begin counting until November 3rd. And the states determine how to validate mail-in and absentee ballots. All of that will take time. Depending on the closeness of the election and the number of mail-in absentee ballots, it could take a week or even longer. If you have not yet voted and are planning to vote in person, here are a couple tips for, that you need to know before you go to vote. First of all, it might not be a quick process. Don't go to vote if you only have a 30 or 45 minute window. Be prepared to wait. You might want to take a bottle of water or a snack with you. Go with a buddy, particularly if you are concerned about the election process, waiting and in line for the polls, any sort of unrest, take a buddy. In Georgia, you have to have a valid current photo ID. You should also take a black pen with you as that could expedite the voting process. Know how you want to vote. Here are two links, one to Ballotpedia and one to the Georgia Secretary of State's um, website that give you sample ballots. In Georgia, for example, we are having a special Senate election and there are multiple candidates on the ballot and there are three uh, referendums on the ballot. So you want to know what those are and how you want to vote before you get to the voting place. If the polls close while you are in line, stay in line. You are allowed to vote. Look up polling place regulations and rights for your state. For example, in Georgia, you are not allowed to use your phone while you're voting. You can't wear clothing directly promoting a specific current candidate. You can have notes with you. You can ask for a new ballot if you make a mistake. You absolutely should ask for a provisional ballot if you get to the polling place and they say that your name is not on the list. You can also leave some races blank on your ballot. If you're dropping off a mail-in or absentee ballot, please make sure it's an official location or drop box. Every vote matters. Your vote matters. Be sure that your vote will count correctly. What happens after all of this if we find out the results of the election and you don't like them? Don't get discouraged. There are lots of ways you can affect change in our society. Voting is just one of them. If your chosen candidate didn't win, you could do any number of these things on the slide. Contact your state or local party, volunteer to work to promote their policies, and get their candidates elected in the next cycle. You could contact your elected officials, letting them know your stance on issues that are important to you. You can join an interest group that's focused on the issues most important to you. Contact a local organization that's working on an issue you care about and ask how you can help their efforts. You can donate your money, your time, your passion, your expertise. There are many ways that you can make your voice heard. Knowledge is power. Learn the most effective way to make your voice heard. If you want to participate effectively, you need to understand how the system works. In order to advocate for yourself, you need to understand how the system works. If you want to change the system, you first need to understand how it works. The resources listed on this slide can provide you with more information about the process, election predictions, and what to do 
if you experience difficulty at your polling place. At Bernal, we are here to support everyone. We support inclusivity and equity. We provide support services to all of our students, staff, and faculty. This slide contains a list of the diversity, equity, and inclusivity excellence work group who are happy to provide safe spaces in which to have conversations about any anxiety, fears, hopes you may have about the election. Each name is hyperlinked to the individual's email address. Following the name, you will find their relationship to the university, their preferred pronouns, and any languages other than English in which they are proficient. If you feel you want or need to talk with a professional about your reactions to, feelings about, the election, and what comes after, this slide contains Bernal's mental health resources. I hope you have found this presentation useful. Thank you for listening.